heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 266, covering the week of June 14th through June 18th, 2021. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org. While you're there, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It's a great book by 20 Abbeville Institute scholars. You will also get our daily dose of Dixie, Monday through Friday, sometimes an email on Saturday or Sunday. Of course, this is the primary way that we will communicate with you. We'd like to have your email address so we can send you notifications about upcoming conferences, webinars, uh, programs, anything we do. Our Daily Dose of Dixie, of course, it contains our article for the day, Monday through Friday. So that's a great way to let you know what we're publishing. And we do have a webinar coming up. If you're getting this on Saturday, June 19th, we have a webinar on June 23rd. It's with Marco Bassani. It's on his latest book, which is an Abbeville Institute Press book, Chaining Down Leviathan. So we still have a few tickets left for that, so you should go over to abbevilleinstitute.org. Or if you're on the email list, uh, you know, please begin on that email list. I've sent out several emails notifying people of this. If you're not getting our emails and you're on the list, make sure you check your spam folder. Make sure you whitelist the Abbeville Institute. Whitelist my email address, uh, which you can find. It's mclanahan at abbevilleinstitute.org. Make sure you're getting that information because, again, that's our primary method of communication. Social media has become problematic. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So uh, that's the way that we keep in touch. Um, also, don't forget you can get your Abbeville Institute apparel. Click on that shop tab. You can get uh, high-quality embroidered materials. Um, please rate this podcast where you get podcasts. If you do like our articles, you can share those on social media, uh, whatever social media platform you're using. We do appreciate that. And that lets people know that you're thinking about the Abbeville Institute. Now, let's talk about social media because that is a topic, and we're talking about cancel culture this week. So something interesting happened this past week on social media. A year ago, we published an article on the, on the uh, second iteration, iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. It was an article by Jim Peterson, and it talked, the title of it was The, uh, the uh, Progressive, or, I'm sorry, The Skeleton in... I'm sorry, A Skeleton in the Yankee Progressive Closet, published March 9, 2020. For the image on this particular piece, we used a, a magazine, or at least it was a, I'm sorry, an album cover for sheet music. And the title of the sheet music, which came out in uh, the 19-teens, was We Are All Loyal Klansmen. It has this image of Uncle Sam holding a U.S. flag, which, of course, the Klan in the background. It was used to highlight the fact that this... Second part of the clan, the second clan, was a northern creation, essentially. And that northerners, more than anyone else, were involved in this particular organization. It was the high point of clan activity. And so uh, the, the image of the South being involved in all these things was just a farce. And this was done to highlight this particular position. I think Mr. Peterson did a good job of explaining through, by the way, Mainstream secondary sources. I mean, he's not going out and looking at, uh, you know, just online sources, but he's using mainstream secondary sources uh, for this for this piece. And so we published a link to this on our Facebook page with that image. It had been there for a year. Well, the other day we get a notification that that image uh, was in a violation of Facebook standards. And they, uh, therefore, unpublished our page at Facebook. So, if you go and look at their terms of agreement, anything that they allow images to be published as long as they're used in the way that we use them, which is as a conversation piece, an educational piece, we weren't promoting the Klan at all. In fact, the piece is very much anti-Klan. <laughs> but um, it was... Uh, they banned us, essentially unpublished us and banned us anyways. So this is part of cancel culture. Now you can't even show an image to try to talk about something on a social media platform because that is somehow offensive. Not long before that, we had published an image of the uh, Confederate battle flag to go along with the piece. They also blocked that one. So because of two strikes, we were out. 
But this, Pete, this image stayed there for over a year, and nobody had a problem with it. I guess somebody complained about it at some point. Uh, some little uh, Yankee do-gooder went on there and had uh, got offended by it for whatever reason, because the link to the article clearly un identifies why we were using the image uh, and not in promoting it at all. So we are without a Facebook page. Usually I talk about go out to our Facebook page and like our Facebook page. Well, at this point, there is no Facebook page for Abbeville Institute. I don't know if they will, uh, after we're in jail for a time, I have no idea what's going to happen, if they will uh, republish our page or not. So we still have our Twitter account, and um, we still have our YouTube account, of course, um, which, because logically, we don't do anything that would warrant being banned anywhere. So we're looking for another home for a type of social media. We've investigated some other areas, and that will be forthcoming. But this is certainly part of our, of our problem in modern American society. Cancel culture, you can't even have an image of something, even if it's anti. You're, you're talking about this image. You know, imagine if you're trying to talk about, say, uh, anything controversial in history, and you want to show an image of it. Well, Facebook can ban you for that. So where are we? I mean, this is why Facebook is so problematic and why people should be running from Facebook in droves if they can, and we probably will. We, even if it comes back, we, have, I mean, we haven't decided what we're going to do with that. And that'll be a conversation, an ongoing conversation, how we want to handle that. But um, you know, Facebook is, uh, is problematic for American free speech, without question. And I think that's the, that's the issue we're facing in modern American society. And so in term, when it comes to cancel culture, I mean, look, We've got a couple of pieces this week, three pieces actually this week, about cancel culture. The first is the Maryland State song has been taken down uh, in Maryland, My Maryland, and James Ryder Randall's excellent poem, uh, which was made into the Maryland State song. You can't find a more um, interesting state song in the United States. Of course, other state songs have been canceled. We talked about that in Old Virginia. That state song was canceled, for example. So uh, we're seeing this now, anything that is offensive. We also are seeing, and the left is really showing their colors, and I think this is where all of the people, all the conservatives, quote-unquote, who had been in favor of taking down Confederate symbols and Confederate monuments didn't realize what they were doing. They're opening the door to nonsense because now you've got a high-profile uh, African-American saying, we need, we need to change the U.S. flag. <laughs> I mean, this flag is stained with racism and, and slavery. and every, Let's change the flag. Well... We've said that for years. Uh, the only flag uh, that flew over slave trading vessels in American history is the U.S. flag. I mean, so uh, it flew over slavery longer than the Confederate flag. So, I mean, if you're going to start taking down symbols of slavery, well, then that flag needs to go, too. And we always said it tongue-in-cheek, knowing that, uh, I mean, this is something that most Americans would oppose. Conservatives, oh, no, you can't do that. You've got to take down the flag of treason. Well, the U.S. flag could be a flag of treason. At least the British could say it's the flag of treason. I mean, this is what they might consider a flag of treason. So this is where we are, right? We've, we've gotten to a point where we've opened the Pandora's box, and, and conservatives have been certainly part of this process. Without question, they've been part of the process. They are highly problematic. And uh, they're highly problematic because, particularly northern conservatives, because they don't see what they're doing. Uh, there was a piece, and I'll, and I'll get into this in my own podcast at, uh, at brianmcclanahan.com. There was a piece by Kevin Cruz, who I usually don't agree with. But Kevin Cruz pointed out something that I said in Chronicles magazine uh, a few weeks, about a month ago now, actually. And I'll be responding to in next month's issue of Chronicles. But where the left and the right are the same and, and... Not just that. Uh, the way that the right portrays the founding and, of course, people like Martin Luther King allows the left to punch holes in their argument. And this is exactly what Kevin Cruz did. I mean, because they're being dishonest. So we've got a situation now with cancel culture where it, what, what should have happened is these conservatives should have said, no, shut up. No, shut up. We're not, we're not entertaining, tearing anything down. We're not entertaining doing anything like that. All we're going to do, if you want to add things, fine. But we're not taking anything down. And, of course, the sad fact is that some of these monuments, which have been targeted for destruction, are national historic uh, monuments, right? So, I mean, these have, been, these have been designated landmarks by the U.S. government. And yet, 
They can just go in and take them down, spray paint them, do all kinds of things to them. Uh, the barbarians, which is what Boyd Cathy calls them on Thursday, defending the West against the barbarians. And this is true. I mean, look, a barbarian, by definition, the Greeks called them. This is a Greek term. It means someone who bathes little and is uneducated. The fact that these people are uneducated is certainly, certainly part of this. I mean, there's no, there's no question that uh, being uneducated is the real issue with these people. And if you look at, I mean, just the, the most, and we're going to have a piece on this uh, either next week or the, ne- uh, the next week about Juneteenth, the new f- federal holiday. If you look at the way it was being portrayed by the media, now they, they've realized they've made some major mistakes in this. And if you look at the, the way that the, uh, <laughs> the pieces on it have changed over the last couple of days because they were hammered over this, that somehow June 19th was the end of slavery in America. I mean, they, they were hammered over this. And so now, oh, well, yeah, we understand that. Oh, well, maybe it continued a little longer. But um, so it was a, it was a, the historical ignorance of Americans is highly problematic. And that contributes, of course, to this cancel culture, this war on American society that has now uh, gripped the left. I mean, they really want to destroy anything traditional in America. This is, this is clear. I said it in 2015 to the Christian Science Monitor and was laughed at for saying that. Six years ago, I said, look, they're not going to stop here. This is it. I mean, you, you, take, you start taking down Confederate symbols and monuments, that's opening the door, and they will kick it open, and they're going to take everything. And that's exactly what's going to happen. They're going to take everything. The piece on Monday by J.L. Bennett, A Southern Song, A Southern Heritage, canceled, is very, very good. And she gets into uh, the history of the piece and, uh, you know, the fact that carry me back to old Virginia, my old Kentucky home, were, were also canceled. And that was done, you know, years ago. But uh, this particular uh, piece gets into the fact that, uh, you know, this, this song... Uh, was just so revered by the by the state of Maryland. And she actually says this, you know, once revered in the old line state, Randall was honored by Democrat Governor J. Miller Taws when he proclaimed the first days of 1961 James Ryder Randall Week. In her December 31st, 1960 article on the Governor's Proclamation, the Washington's Evening Stars and Christmas offers a straightforward and factual account of the history of the song. But now a Maryland governor defames Randall, and unschooled reporters express surprise at Maryland's southern pass. Oh, see, this is it. The lack of education. The barbarians are suffering from historical ignorance. The real problem in America is historical ignorance. And the use of history as a weapon. It's not to seek to understand. We can disagree with what people said before. We can disagree with what they thought about things. We We can do all of that. But we should seek to understand. That's the point of history. It's not a weapon. It's not to be wielded for some type of ends. It's to, it's to understand where we are and where we've been and why we were there at that particular point and why we did certain things. Ignoring the, de- the deluge of calls and emails from people who wanted to save the state song, Larry Hogan signed the legislation banning it. Relieved to finally to get rid of Maryland of a relic of the Confederacy, he said, never really cared for. Hogan at one time, however, had very clearly opposed attempts to rewrite history. Even if his veto likely would have been overridden by the legislature, the governor missed an opportunity to have displayed courage and honor. Larry Hogan, however, has aspirations to the White House and a politically expedient reputation as a mid-Atlantic moderate to uphold. He wants Maryland to be New Jersey. Support for an outdated and out-of-touch rebel anthem would not have helped his career plans. Interjecting himself into the state's battle over the rebel anthem is U.S. Congressman Jamie Raskin, born in Washington, D.C., the son of transplanted Midwestern radicals Marcus and Barbara, excuse me, Barbara Bellman Raskin. The congressman who represents Maryland's 8th District has submitted to the General Assembly, new version of Maryland, my Maryland, particularly a more just and politically correct retelling of the state's history. Though they will still have the state flag to contend with, and they'll come gunning for that presently. Uh, Raskin and other carpetbaggers will no longer be bothered by this most haunting and beautiful reminder of Maryland's southern heritage. And as her statues, artifacts, and southern symbols disappear, it becomes easier for educators to teach falsehoods to school children who learn that the elderly Barbara Fritchie, a Marylander, bravely waved the Union colors out her window and dared Jackson to shoot her old gray head. That Lincoln, a friend to the old state, old line state, was a kind of leader who wanted to make men free and save the Union, begging the question that it had to be saved. 
But the truth is that Fritchie was a Pennsylvanian living in Frederick, Maryland, who never met Stonewall when he was there. The truth is that Lincoln was a tyrant who cared only about northern business interests. And seven days into his unjust war in the south, his was the despot's heel on thy Maryland shore, as the song goes. Great piece. And then we've got um, the VMI situation and Forrest Marion, Marion, his last piece on this issue. Now, Forrest Marion, Marion uh, graduated from VMI, and um, he's written quite extensively on the changing nature of VMI. And this really little piece on VMI, a little meritocracy about the history of the institution, is just very good. Again, very good, because it hits to the heart of the cancel culture issue. What are we doing in America? Why are we canceling all these things? What is that going to change? What is it going to make better Anything? Anything? Well, of course, this gets back to critical race theory and what that means. And the idea is to show that all of these things are constructs, right? This is all just a construct and all these things. That the, the system, the, the system, this is why they say systemic racism is there. The system was created to, to suppress people. That VMI itself is a system of racism. That the U.S. flag is a symbol of racism. That uh, a song is a symbol of all these systemic things, and we have to get rid of all the systemic stuff, and then, only then, will we live in a racially just society. That's the point, and of course, it is cultural Marxism. The idea is to level everything. There's no culture that's better than another. There's no civilization that's better than another. There's no symbols or anything that's better than any other. It's all just there. This is the point. It's to level everything. Instead of just economic leveling, which is what Marxism does, this is cultural Marxism. It's cultural leveling. The Greeks weren't great. The United States wasn't great. There's nothing great about any of these things. They're just all bad. Rome wasn't great. Christianity's not great. It's all just bad. It's all just bad stuff because it oppresses people. And the only thing that is great is anything that was oppressed at one point. So you take the oppressed and you elevate them to the level of now oppressors because that's essentially what's happening. It's all by design. In reality, critical race theory, all of this is about one thing, and it's always been about this, no matter what you're talking about. It's about power, having power over other people to change the way they think and act and say and do, and having power in government, getting the spoils of power, whether it's monetary compensation fame, whatever it is, the spoils of it. This is what it's all about. And they will deny it. Of course they'll deny it. But when you look at what these people do when they finally get power and get money, they go out and do the exact same thing that anybody else has those things. They buy lots of houses, they get on television, they want power, they want to control people. This is what they do. And if anybody saw this as a naked power grab, they would block all of it. No shut up would be the response. Because taking down statues and symbols and everything else, again, as Joyce Bennett points out about Larry Hogan, why does he want to do this? Because he wants power. He wants to be president. He's not going to be president, but that's what he wants. Nobody's going to vote for Larry Hogan. But this is what he wants. He has aspirations. He wants power. And to do that, you cut deals. In a democratic system, you got to cut deals to get power because you got to please people. So, when you look at the piece on Friday by Sarah Sash, she's an attorney in Virginia, grave robbers. There was a there was a typo in the initial piece um, where A. P. Hill's monument was located. We changed that. The monument, of course, to A.P. Hill is slated for demolition, and this is being done by the Richmond mayor, LeVar Stoney. The problem is that A.P. Hill is buried in the monument, and he's buried standing up. So when they take this monument down, they are going to disturb his grave, which is a felony according to Virginia law, and they know it. They know it. So what this attorney points out is, hey, look, if you're, I mean, you're going to be committing a felony by taking this monument down. What Sass points out is that A.P. Hill is a three-time war veteran, Mexican-American War, Seminole War, and, of course, the Civil War. So he is a veteran, at least from the first two, right? I mean, the Mexican-American War, 
He's a U.S. veteran. You can say that because he served in the Civil War, he's not, he's a traitor, but he is a U.S. veteran. And so because of that, where Stoney's going to put him is at a sewage treatment plant. I mean, where are they going to put this grave? Where are they going to put it? At a sewage treatment plant. Now, they've recognized the fact that they really can't do this. She says, also, according to the Code of Virginia, if a person willfully and intentionally defiles a dead human body, he or she is automatically guilty of a Class 6 felony. And they're going to do it by putting them at a sewage treatment plant. Now, they know it because they've sought an injunction. The city of Richmond was made aware of these statutes at its Urban Design Committee on June 10th. And the city of Richmond's response was to seek a reprieve from the justice system of Virginia. If a city knows what it is doing is so heinous that it has to seek court approval to do it beforehand, then the morality is totally lost. Well, of course it is. And of course, it's all about corruption. One of the board members is making a lot of money on the city of Richmond. Uh, and so they seek to gain, at least in their mind, by taking out all this stuff that people would not like. And This is what it's all about. Power. Again, it's about power. So where does this leave us? You know, we have to defend the West against the barbarians, as Boyd Cathy says. This is where we are. Cathy says, I believe that the cultural artifacts of our civilization, including the arts and music that it has produced, are just as significant, if not more so, than the everyday debates over such topics as the budget or some January 6th commission. Those artifacts are part and parcel of what we call the West, our inheritance stretching back not only to Rome, but to classical Greece and Jerusalem, and they define it, convey its talents and its virtues, and give it expression. For the wide-ranging, nearly irresistible forces of revolution and its possessed zealots desire our total extinction, not just politically and economically, but in every facet of our lives. Indeed, no one can stand by idly for long. No one can escape its tentacles and its reach. In the end, neutrality or fleeing to the tall grass can only be a temporary solution which ends in disaster. Even worse, attempting to placate the beast or to pretend that the forces which oppose us are like in the good old days when Democrats and Republicans could sit down and work out some equitable compromise or solution, a la Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, is not only foolish but encourages our fanatical enemies, emboldens them, and speeds up their barbaric work of demolition. Of course. This is exactly what's happening. It's opening the door. Okay, yeah, we can see the Confederates are traitors, so let's take them down. This is Alan Gelzo. This is Victor Davis Hanson. These are traitors, so we should take them all down. Michael Lind, this is what's happening. Well, it's just, I mean, it's something that we should consider. No, it's not. None of it should be considered. No, shut up. This is the point. You have to take a stand somewhere, and we should have taken it with Confederate symbols and Confederate monuments and saying, look, let's talk about these things. Let's talk about the other side of it. Why is it one side, one narrative of history gets promoted while the other one doesn't? This is the question. Um, we have one narrative of things, of events, and we have another narrative of events, and they both could be a valid narrative. But why do we have to have, why does one have to be ascendant over the other? You could say that, well, we made a mistake in making one ascendant over the other, so let's, let's invite the other side. Let's talk about it. You could say that. But you don't take anything down. You don't contextualize. You don't do these are these are these are monuments standing to a time and a place. These are symbols standing of a time and a place. And by calling them all kinds of names and saying they're traitors, you're you're actually arguing that people who admire these things are not American. They're unpatriotic. They are told to denounce their ancestors. That is evil. It is evil. That is exactly what the left wants to do. He says, Boyd says, There is, I believe, no other way to put it. The enemies we face that, and that increasingly destroy our patrimony, our culture, our birthright, our civilization, are indeed in some ways possessed, yes, even in the traditional theological sense. Not all, of course, to the same degree, but nevertheless, there is a common denominator between the screaming lunatic Antifa demonstrator in the streets who exalts in the truly demonic destruction of our cities and the artifacts of our history and the lunatic professor who rubrics his Vicious mental assault on historic white supremacy in the classroom or in supposedly scholarly journals or in the in vogue passion for critical race theory and the lunatic political leader who enables and abets such insanity. Exactly right. Or 
the social media giants, big tech giants who cancel everything, who censor things because it might be a little bit uh, uncomfortable for somebody. But if it's there to talk about, well, then we should talk about it. The mob is destroying things. The image we use on this piece, by the way, is a Thomas Cole image, the uh, his series on civilization. And you look at this image, and if you can go out and find it, you have this beautiful civilization, and it's being destroyed. What is it being destroyed by? What are they doing? They're tearing down the architecture. They're tearing down the monuments. They're burning. They're barbarians. They're barbarians. What are we doing in modern American society? We're tearing down the monuments. We're tearing down the symbols. We're tearing down the architecture. We're burning. Who are? These people are, by definition, uncivilized barbarians. So, one thing we can do, of course, is support organizations like the Institute. We can try to create our own things and go our own way and have our own things, but this is going to be very hard. It's a, it's a cultural war that we are really in a defensive fight of our lives to try to keep this stuff there. And I don't know where we go from here except doing what we I mean. We got we got to start thinking local and start working at the local level to try to keep things there, try to preserve something. Start with your family, of course, and then work your way up. That's the Aristotelian thing to do. Now, the last piece of the week, and I just want to mention it, it's a piece by Clyde Wilson on a book by Howard White on a theory that Lincoln was actually um, that Lincoln was not a Lincoln, right? He was uh, born to someone else. Um, and th- that there's maybe some truth to this. So this is Howard White's 14th book, Rebirthing Lincoln, a biography. And he says, there is no documentary record of Abraham Lincoln's birth. Generally, people have traced out every president's origins back many generations and centuries. But for Lincoln, almost nothing has been established, about, even about his grandparents. The accepted Lincoln story is a birth date of February 12th to parents Thomas Lincoln and his wife Nancy Hanks. The evidence for this was written in a newly purchased Bible by Lincoln himself more than 40 years after the fact, when Lincoln's political career was getting a new start. In fact, Lincoln was born in Rutherford County in western North Carolina, the illegitimate child of the illegitimate servant girl, Nancy Hanks, and a proper, prosperous married landowner, Abraham Enlow. Abraham Lincoln was already a toddler when his mother married Thomas Lincoln in Kentucky. Abraham never visited Thomas Lincoln after he left home. Thomas Lincoln was never introduced to Abraham's wife and children. Abraham refused to attend Thomas's deathbed or funeral. Thomas Lincoln was short, stocky, and somewhat lethargic, while Abraham was not- notable for his height, long arms, and legs, and energy. Neither the Hankses nor the Lincoln's family had ever shown any above-average intelligence or enterprise. Enter Abraham Enlow, who was a successful man for his time and place, as were his forebearers on both sides. He says, White Marshall's exhaustive material for his case, most of which I am leaving for the reader. But he says, two things convince me. Comparing a photo of Abraham and his probable half-brother Wesley Enlow, they never met, but both have the unusually long arms and legs that everyone noticed about Lincoln. The second thing is that everybody who has studied Lincoln knows about his ruthless, relentless, and devious political ambition. Covering up illegitimacy was natural for such a man, even if fear of disclosure perhaps had less influence on Lincoln's conduct than the author thinks. So, again, a little different look at Lincoln. Now, there are people that would say this just doesn't work. I've seen both sides of this, but certainly um, this is something that, Hey, it's historical inquiry. Is there something to this? Should we should we be talking about this? Is Lincoln really a creation of a myth? I mean, is Lincoln a myth himself? Now, at the Abbey Institute, we would say, yes, it's a myth. Lincoln is a myth. The whole Lincolnian nationalism is a myth. All of it's a myth. Lincoln made up stuff. And that myth has become part of the American character on both the left and the right. And that's important to point out. So when you try to seek to understand, and I think that's what Clyde Wilson is doing here, trying to seek to understand, that's where we are. But the other side doesn't want to do that. They want to use history as a weapon. And Lincoln was using history as a weapon in his Gettysburg Address in 1863, even though he misstated history in that, in that address. All right. 
So that's it for this week at the Abbeville Institute. Stay tuned for updates on our social media saga and what we're going to do with that. If you have suggestions as to where you have social media accounts outside of Facebook, let us know. Send me an email. Uh, leave us a comment at Abbeville Institute. Try to do that so we can go and try to work our way into different areas, try to make those things work so we can have the biggest following we can get because social media is important. It's a way to keep in contact and a way to, to stay in touch with people. Of course, our email address is key to that, so make sure you're on our email list if you're getting this podcast. Uh, make sure you're doing that because it is so important. And again, we still have a few tickets left for our next webinar. They're only 10 bucks. I mean, it's, it's an hour Ten bucks for an hour, um, and you get you'll get a you'll get a, a link to it, so you can download it and keep it forever. So you pay ten bucks, and you can listen to the lecture as many times as you like uh, after the fact. We also have that Abbeville Academy, which if you've missed any of these webinars, you can go there. They're fifteen dollars there because we have to pay some administrative fees to put them there. But regardless, fifteen dollars there, so you can get any of our previous lectures. We've done this since December. This is our seventh webinar coming up. Fantastic. I mean, we're, we're, we've uh, done this for now seven months, and that's, they're a lot of fun. It's a great time. You get to ask questions, and uh, I host all these things, so it's a way for you also to ask me questions directly if you want. Um, but it's a, it's a great time and, and a great way to interact with uh, Abbeville Institute folks and, of course, some of the scholars that, who are, are uh, the, the core of the Institute. Marco Bassani was at the founding of the Institute, so very important. All right. Until next time, good day.